don't know if you know that I do, I did share a womb with a sister, and I have a twin sister, and uh, she looks nothing like me, thank the Lord. And uh, I was in the eighth grade when our parents allowed us to go to a Bible camp. This Bible camp was about 13 days long, which is awesome at that age. You get to leave your home. The uh, bus ride was about three hours long. Uh, you could just imagine driving in Texas. Didn't matter what direction you were going. Eight hours, you're still in Texas, okay? Just like Florida. You want to get out of Florida. You sleep. You wake up. We're like, where are we? Florida. Okay. So we get to this camp. I'm super excited. As I'm exiting the bus, someone decided to trip my sister. I was like, oh, you, my friend, are dead. I love my sister dearly. That's a Latino thing in us. Uh, we will fight for our families. Even if they did something right or wrong, we're going to fight for them no matter what. I had mentioned earlier, this is a 13-day camp. My experience had been ruined because I was enraged with anger because this snotty little kid who was taller than me tripped my sister. So I'd go to bed thinking of what I'm going to do to get even with this guy. I'd wake up dreaming and salivating my revenge. I would get angry every time I saw him walk by. He would annoy me when he spoke. I didn't even know the kid. But you know what he did? Tripped my sister. Day 11 goes by. We had a wonderful Sunday school service. And at the end, do you think I got anything out of it? No. Nope. Can you tell me why? Because I was thinking on how to get my revenge on this kid. I had missed what God was trying to show me that day. Actually, the whole camp. In the afternoon, we had this activity. Huge hill. We soaped it down, and we had these donuts with bungee cords attached to them. Our objective was to pull as hard as we could to get the person to the lake. God got my attention that day because as we're pulling, the bungee cord did what? Snapped and whipped my back like nobody's business. All five feet and eight inches when I was an eighth grader. I was probably 184 pounds, short and chunky. The most awkward years of my life. The loudest girl scream occurred that came out of my mouth because that bungee cord really got me. No. So if you've ever felt pain like that before, I don't recommend it. Why do I share that story with you? We've all been there. We've all held on to something that could have been easily just, all right, that's it. It is what it is. I'm going to move on with life. And you know the cherry on top? My sister could have cared less that she got tripped. The irony that my twin sister, the one person I can trust to share the same feelings with me because we shared the same womb. She's like, it was an accident probably. It's the last time I got your back. Unforgiveness will trap you in your ways. As long as you fail to forgive an offender, you're shackled to the past. Unforgiveness keeps that pain alive. You guys are probably thinking, why is he sharing unforgiveness topics? We're in the Psalm series. Well, I'll get to that. I'm glad you asked. We try to get revenge because someone did something to us. That is the human nature. You stir up and you make yourself progressively anger, angrier. You go through life accumulating bad feelings. You think about it all the time. Unforgiveness just imprisons you. You're like a prisoner in your unforgiveness. When I said earlier, it's easier to just say, you know what, I forgive you. That opens the door to the cell and you're free to go. 
Unforgiveness will produce bitterness. Oh, does it ever? Every time I heard the kid talk, I was like, what the heck? Be quiet. You're so annoying. Oh, my gosh. You just get so angry and bitter at him every time you, he did anything. The longer you remember the offense, the more data you accumulate on it. Bitterness is not just a sin. It is an infection, and it will infect your whole life. Anger begins to rage in, and it can easily get out of control. Your emotions begin to run wild. Forgiveness, on the other hand, dismantles bitterness and replaces it with love, joy, kindness, the fruits of the spirit. It's easier said than done. I hear, I hear what you're saying. But Paco, you don't go to high school. I did. I got made fun of when I was in the ninth grade. But I've learned to just in one ear and out the other. I learned it so well that when my teachers were teaching me, it happened in class. In one ear and out the other. My coaches would make me run because I'd have a C average in math. By the way, two plus two is four. Just so you know, okay? I did graduate. I know, I know. But most importantly, unforgiveness will hinder you from your fellowship with God. Jesus said that it's easier to forgive. But also he said, if you don't forgive men, my father won't forgive you. That should be a gut check. If I'm not willing to forgive my offender, the Bible says in Mark 11, 25, the father will not forgive your sins. If you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. The ongoing relationship with God that we had just counted all as lost. I would sit there and think, why would I sentence myself to not be right with God? Was there something that I wanted to do better than God could do himself? The fleshly desire of wanting to get revenge is that much easier rather than humbling yourself before the Lord and asking for his guidance and his power and his will to be done. We live in a society that knows and cares little about forgiveness. In fact, I would think that one of the major contributions to the destruction of relationships in our culture is the absence of forgiveness. Would you agree? Our culture pushes us to unforgive. It celebrates and exalts people who are not willing to forgive. They make heroes out of these people. You all seen them in social media. They get even. We have a society filled with bitterness, vengeance, anger, and hate towards others. Absalom demonstrated all of those points I had shared with you earlier. Why? Because something happened that he didn't think was handled the right way. His father, David, was king at the time. And a really bad situation occurred in Absalom's family, and David didn't do anything about it. For a Christian, however, the failure to forgive is an unthinkable thing. Whatever the issue, whatever the offense, a failure to forgive is a blunt act of disobedience. The Bible clearly says that if anyone offends us, we are to forgive them. How many times? Matthew 18, 22 says it. 70 times 7. That's an endless number of times. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer them the left. But Paco, that's so disrespectful. I want you to see how easy it is just to forgive. You have two cheeks. Give them the other one. Like I said earlier, Absalom disagreed with how David didn't punish the offender. 
because of the situation that had occurred. So David left. He left Jerusalem for about three years, went somewhere, and lived there for three years with his, his pa, his grandfather, his abuelito. And he was there for three years. Can you imagine what he was thinking or trying to think about the whole three years there? Trying to get closer to God, grow in his relationship with God. No, that's not what he was doing. He was plotting on how to overthrow King David from his kingdom, from his chair. And I thought he did a phenomenal job on how he came up with uh, taking over. Not that I condone it. Um, he reaches his father's ear and says, hey, dad, can I please come back? I, I've changed. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm all better. What do you think David said? Absolutely. Father's arms are always open. Yes, come home. You should be here anyway. Absalom returns to Jerusalem. I'm sorry, to Israel. For two years, he didn't say a single word to his father. What? Two years. The amount of anger that he must have accumulated from the five years that he was away. Three plus two is five. Just, you know, okay? Yeah, just, just checking. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. For years, Absalom had been working behind David's back to take control of the kingdom. Now Absalom had gathered an army. He got 50 horsemen, 200 soldiers, and rode, woke up every morning, and headed to the front gates. Now you're sitting there thinking, why would he wake up early and get all of these horsemen and soldiers and just go to the front gates? Well, you see, in that time, people would come see who for their problems. My neighbor stole my sheep. Whatever shall I do? Well, they went to go see the king, and the king would have vengeance, or he was the judge. Well, Absalom, part of his plan, would sit at the city gates, and when people would come up to him, you there, what tribe do you represent? And they would tell him, Absalom was a good-looking dude. I don't know if you know this. He had a, head, a set of hair like nobody's business. All right, this guy was pleasing to the eye. So David would sit there. I'm sorry, Absalom would sit there and basically do David's work. And then out of the corner of his breath, he would say, man, if only you guys had a king who is as fair as I am, you should tell everybody. See, that was, David, that was Absalom's way of trying to get the heart of the people. And he succeeded. The news came to David in 2 Samuel 15, 3. The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Many rose up against David. Among the many were some of David's most trusted men. Now, can you imagine? Like, that is a punch to the gut. Here you are doing life with these guys for more than who knows how long, and they just betray you? As a king, I'd be like, that's it. Off with your head. How dare you? That's treasoning. You think David did things like that? I haven't read anything like that. I don't believe he did. Even David's nephew commanded some of Absalom's armies. What? His own family? I would encourage you to actually read the story in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and even the few chapters before to see why Absalom got so angry and bitter towards his dad. Even the people in Israel were saying, there's no way David's going to come out of this. People would throw rocks as David decided to leave because David had such a pure heart that he loved his people. He loved everyone that was in his kingdom. And he was like, you know what, guys? L let's go. Let's get out of here. I don't want any harm to come to you. As a king, I'd be like, all right, you all stay here. 
let him do what he's going to do. Gives me a couple of days to go out to the wilderness. Uh, you pack my donkey. You know which mat I like to sleep on. I'm out. No, David was like, all right, guys, I'd encourage you guys to leave. Absalom has grown so powerful. I don't want any harm to come to y'all. His people were like, no, king, dude, you're my boy. We've, we've gone through worse. Do you remember the time we ran away from Saul? Remember the cave? Come on, this is nothing. You, you got this. David's like, okay. David's back was against the wall. His own family was trying to basically kill him because of the injustice that he couldn't bring to the offender. In all of this, David wrote Psalms 3. And I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, go to Psalms 3 because this is where we get to the nitty-gritty. See, this earlier portion of unforgiveness and bitterness, that's just something that I wanted you guys to learn from Absalom of what not to do when someone offends you, when someone says your hat is ugly or your shoes are dirty or, man, summer did you well. What would you put, like 15 pounds? You know, I hope nobody says things like that, but, you know, in, in one ear and out the other, right? So in Psalms chapter 3, Verse 3 through 4, I want you to learn and experience the spiritually matureness of David when he wrote this psalm. The Lord is a shield. David was in a fight for his life. He needed a shield. A shield is only relevant during a battle. It protects you from a sword or arrows uh, from penetrating your person. And it means that when the shield is held, nothing's going to get through it. But here, when David says, the Lord is my shield, he says, you are my shield. It didn't prevent Absalom from attacking do you know what it did? Do you know what God as the shield did for David? It protected him, but it prevented Absalom's attack from succeeding. David's faith right here at this point was, okay, Lord, I am, I am your humble servant. I believe that you're going to come through again. I believe you're going to keep me safe and all the people that are following me. David says the Lord is his glory. David's faith was so great that nothing outweighed the importance of God, not even his own family and friends. Nothing outweighed the importance. Tell your neighbor, nothing outweighed. Nothing outweighed the importance of God. David realized how important God meant to him that he didn't conform to the patterns of the world or the situations that had come around him, family and friends. The Lord is the lifter of heads. We're still in Psalms 3. David says, the Lord lifted his head. To have one head lifted means it must be what? It must be lowered. Your head must be lowered before the Lord. We can either lower our heads before God or God's going to lower it for us. David's head had been lowered because, Dina had shared this last week, of his sins with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 12, 10 through 12. And the rebellion of Absalom was the consequence of that sin. Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that I, if I sin tonight, something is going to happen because of that sin? Absolutely. Darn tootin'. 
if there are unchecked sins, it will be brought to light. Nothing stays hidden. That was free, by the way. But hear me out. If you humble yourself before the Lord and ask for forgiveness, it is wiped clean. It's as far as the east is from the west. And I don't even know how far that is, but it's far. I mean, it's, it's, it's far. Right, Eli? It's far. But David trusted in the mercy and the grace of God to raise his head up again. When we put our faith and trust in God, he will protect us in times of trouble. But the only way that that's going to happen is if we humble ourselves before him in faith. The only way God's going to protect us is if we're humbling ourselves before him in faith. When I turned 18, I was brave enough to go and jump out of an airplane. My mom didn't approve But as an 18-year-old, here in America, I think you're considered an adult. So I picked up on a few things growing up as a Latino here in America. My mom would throw something at me if I disrespected her. Even today, if I yell at her, she'll throw the chancla at me. And she's very accurate with that shoe, by the way. I could be in the other room and it just... Back of the head. But anyway, when I turned 18, I jumped out of an airplane. Where do you think my faith was? In that parachute, absolutely. Every cell in me was trusting that that parachute, not only was it going to open, but it was going to hold me and bring me down to safety. That level of faith times a million needs to be in the Lord to allow him to fight your battles for you. That's what David did. He humbled himself before the sight of the Lord, and he kept kept him safe. James 4.10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Psalms 5 through 6. We're still in chapter 3. David lay down and slept. Sleep is a time of vulnerability. I don't know if you guys ever experienced a sleepless night. I know I have, especially when I did something wrong. You like sleep with one eye open and one eye shut, hoping your dad's not going to come in and whip you while you pretend to sleep. You laugh because it's true. You guys time the time. You know when your father was coming. I wasn't afraid of my mom when I hit my growth spurt. My dad, on the other hand, he had Hercule hands. He'd lift that hand up. You'd hear the wind just break. You're like, oh, gosh, what did I do? So you've had sleepless nights. David here writes, I laid down and slept. What kind of courage did David must have to sleep knowing he had Absalom and his army coming after him? I'll tell you what. The protection of the Lord, the faith that David had, knowing that his father was going to keep him safe. See, David slept, and the pursuers, God made it so difficult that they couldn't find him or his people that were hiding. Why? He put his faith and trust in God. He woke up because the Lord sustained him. I woke up praying, oh, God, please Let my dad leave for work. David woke up and gave thanks to the Lord. He gives credit for making it through the night. No enemy had come to take his life. No fear had come to deny him rest. Again, I'm going to share another story. When I was in high school, I was mischievous. And around 4th of July, I don't know who remembers Blockbusters. Every time you rented a video cassette or DVD, there was what? You didn't have to get out of your car. Return slots. So one day, me and my friend Matt got a bunch of black hats, like the 100 roll, lit it up, and stuffed it in the return slot as fast as we could. 
and we drove away in his mother's Toyota Prius. The fear that came upon us after doing that stupid thing was unbearable. Like, I can't even describe it. I couldn't sleep last night. I spent the night at Matt's house. My mom found out I could never go to his house again. I lost a friend. That's another thing Latinos moms do. When someone gets their sweet little innocent boy in trouble, you're shunned. You're never coming to my house to eat the tamales. You're done. I could do no wrong in the sight of my parents. Fear set in. Can you imagine having people chasing you? Do you think fear set on David? No. The word of the Lord says not even fear denied him rest. David would not be afraid even if 10,000 people came against him. 10,000 people. I get three or four amp bites and I'm done for the day. Okay, you laugh, but you've never been bitten by actual Floridian fire ants, okay? Those hurt. And then you go three or four days, and then a nice little surprise is left there, nice and white pussy. And you can't really pop it because your hands, you need two. And you're like, but then you hear that. <laughs> Not even 10,000 people came against him. Fear is a great enemy. And if we permit it to go unchecked, it will destroy us. David's fear was conquered by his faith, and the result is integrity that it won't bow down, it won't bow under pressure or in front of others. The result is a faith that will fight with courage in the face of great adversity. So Vox, trust in God to bring you a wonderful sleep at night. Knowing that God is fighting your battle. Knowing that God actually knows your situation. He knows what you're walking through. It doesn't surprise him. It, it's mind-boggling that we try to surprise God. It's like when you finally de decide to get the courage to humble yourself before the Lord, it's like, I was sitting right here waiting for you to just come. And ask. Like, it, it was that easy. You could have just Snapchatted me, and we could have just taken care of this. Like, that's how easy it is. The Lord provides action. The last few verses of Psalms chapter 3. David says, arise and save me to God. David calls upon the Lord to stand up for him. In our most desperate hours and cries to God. Take the form of of just pleading for him. David says that God has already defeated his enemy. He says God has struck them on the cheek and broken their teeth. Now that is a God worth worshiping, knowing that he's going to fight your battle, but strike your enemy on the cheek and give him a new dental plan. Hope they're insured. Break their teeth. Yes, Lord. That'll teach him. It is an image that I want to see over and over. David recognized the only source of salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Blessing upon God's people. Salvation and blessing is used simultaneously here. To be blessed is to be saved. We are saved from our enemies by calling upon the Lord. We are saved from our enemies just by calling on the name of the Lord. That should encourage you tonight, especially when school is just around the corner. God, I pray that you just keep me safe from Chantel and Billy this year, Lord. Gosh. David shared that God took care of his enemies. Do you guys know what happened to Absalom? Do you guys, have you guys ever read this story? Like I laughed out loud when I read 
how Absalom had been defeated. In the Bible, Absalom dies in the hands of one of David's soldiers. Absalom was riding on a donkey, fleeting away from David's armies. Because at this point, the Lord had given victory over David. All is well. Absalom, I shared earlier, is a good-looking dude and, I mean, eye-pleasing. And he had a bushel of hair, like 80s-style hair, like boof. Do you guys know how much that hair weighed? It actually shares that in the story. No. No, but it's close. Two and a half pounds. That is a lot of hair. to be. Can you imagine having to wash and dry that thing every day? I mean, I do that every day with my hair anyway. Conditioned twice. And I, and I blow dry it. And then when it gets of length, I flat iron it and have those perfect spikes. Anyway, so Absalom is riding on the donkey. And his hair is just rapunzel And it gets tangled on a bush. What? Tangled on a bush. The donkey's like, later, dude. I'm out of here. I don't know what you did to get David so angry. So a soldier comes and stumbles upon Absalom just hanging there. And every attempt to try to get away, he gets more entangled. So he goes and runs to the camp. Guess what, guys? Absalom is just hanging by the bush from his hair. So much harm has been done to these people. They're like, you know what? Don't even tell David. We go. We find Absalom. Three arrows to the heart. Done. The Lord had given revenge in the best possible way. But later on in the story, you find out that David actually said, I don't want any harm to come to my son. I love my son. He's amazing. But in closing, Vox, I want you to really grasp this. Really let it sink in. Psalms 18.3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. God, this is not my everyday kind of prayer. Maybe it's because it makes something feel like I can't change my circumstances or I think it's impossible. Lord, your word says that the smallest amount of faith can move a mountain. Lord, that will help coming from you. You are a God of miracles. Father, I hope that Vox will acknowledge that the limit you have by not having faith and not praying and asking you to help. Lord, I pray that they will humble themselves and learn that quick. Father, I ask for a complete turnaround in any of the circumstances that we may be walking through right now, Lord. Take every enemy that comes our way, Lord, and let us be victorious before you, God. Lord, take everything that the enemy meant for evil and use it for good. No weapon formed against you can prosper, God. When it's hard to carry on, I need your strength and comfort. Please remind us, Lord, that you are working behind the scenes when I can't feel it. Father, I trust in you to turn my sadness into dancing, my pain into freedom. Teach me to praise you in the storms. Teach me to humble ourselves before you. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.